Never has there been a more fertile playground for revolutionary ideas than Africa. The injustices of Europe's colonization of the continent produced some of history's most passionate revolutionaries, from Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana to Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. Activists with genuine desires to see the liberation of their people from tyranny. However, the winds of independence that swept Africa in the mid-20th century also provided the right conditions for opportunists. Opportunists who would utilize and pervert anti-colonialist and Western ideology for their own personal gain. Many anti-colonial African leaders thus adopted Marxism and socialism, stating intent to free the continent of imperialism and subjugation. But for many, this ideology was nothing more than a mask. A mask used and abused for the pursuit of power, the winning of popular support, the settling of personal scores and the systematic abuse of rival ethnic and tribal groups. Those that styled themselves revolutionaries in Africa, who aligned themselves with Marxism and the East, often became the tyrants they had hoped to crush and ruled with exceptional brutality. In this video are the stories of five of these so-called socialists and their descent into tyranny. Alongside Vietnam and Korea, Angola stands as a symbol of the Cold War, one of the most important proxy wars between the US and the Soviet Union. Historically, Angola has been populated by three distinct political entities, the Kingdom of the Congo in the northwest, the Kingdom of Ndongo in the south, and the Kingdom of Matamba also in the south. It wasn't until the colonization of the territory in 1884 by the Portuguese that the modern concept of Angola was born. Unlike many African colonies, Portugal retained a strong grip on Angola, attempting to assimilate the native population into Portuguese culture. Portugal's policies in Angola created a deep rift between the rural, black peasantry and the mostly urban assimilados, those the Portuguese considered civilized enough to enjoy a fraction of the rights granted to white Portuguese citizens. Discrimination against the black peasantry was ramped up following the takeover of Portugal by a new corporatist, semi-fascist dictatorship known as Estado Novo. It was this dictatorial regime that implemented a policy of no compromise when it came to its colonies. Instead of preparing its colonies for independence following World War II, Portugal began strengthening its grip. Angola was renamed from colony to overseas province in an attempt to avoid UN inspection and protect their bid to join the organization. But the winds of change were impossible to ignore. The Angolan populace thus began to arm, forming resistance groups. Formally, these groups were based on ideology. Informally, they followed the borders of the three old ethnicities. The National Liberation Front of Angola, the FNLA, pursued the re-establishment of the Kingdom of Congo for the northwestern Bakongo people. The National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, adopted Maoism and drew from the central rural of Imbundu people. But the most important of all these groups was the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, the MPLA, who drew support from the Umbundu population and the assimilados in the urban centers. The MPLA was a far-left communist militia and was the most popular movement in Angola. In the 1960s and 70s, these groups began the Angolan War for Independence, with foreign support from the US and Mao's China, following the repeated refusal of Portugal to let go. Though largely ineffective against the better-armed Portuguese military, the uprising had a profound effect on the Portuguese Empire. The fascist regime, though better equipped and able to defeat the rebels in battle, was never fully able to crush them. And so, after almost 15 years of sending Portugal's sons to die for the defunct empire, the people had had enough. Disgruntled military officers in Lisbon toppled the fascist regime and brought the Angolan War to an end in 1974. A year later, independence was granted to all Portuguese colonies, but peace did not last long. The new Angolan transitional government collapsed and the MPLA, under President Augustinho Neto, seized control, establishing a Marxist-Leninist one-party state. This was the beginning of the Angolan Civil War, 
one of the Cold War's most important battlefields. The FNLA and UNITA took up arms against the new regime, supported by Mobutu Zaire and Apartheid South Africa respectively, and both received material aid from the US. But they were no match for the ideologically driven MPLA, who received thousands of troops from Cuba and state-of-the-art weaponry from the Soviets. During this time, the MPLA used the chaos to brutally dispose of any internal opposition. Following a coup attempt in 1977, the MPLA executed between 2,000 to 70,000 plotters and supporters. In 1976, the FNLA was defeated after Zaire formally re-established ties to the MPLA government. But the war continued against UNITA, led by the fanatical warlord Jonas Savimbi, a brutal rebel leader and military commander known for his use of child soldiers. Fighting continued between UNITA and the MPLA government until the end of the Cold War in 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. This saw the end of material support from the USSR and the withdrawal of Cuban troops that pushed the MPLA into negotiations. They agreed to hold elections, but during this time, under President José Eduardo dos Santos, an extermination was being organised. Arms were secretly distributed across the country to MPLA supporters over the course of several weeks. Elections were held in 1992, which saw an MPLA victory of 53%, compared to UNITA's 34%. Savimbi soon after denounced the election as rigged. This was the igniting incident, which sparked what would become known as the Halloween Massacre. From October 30th to November 1st, 1992, those civilians which had been armed by the government began house-to-house -house searches in Luanda for UNITA supporters and members. Those who were found were rounded up, tortured, and summarily executed. Even UNITA Vice President Jeremias Chitunda couldn't escape, being shot in the head on November 2nd in the streets of Luanda. Over the three-day massacre, an estimated 30,000 people were executed. Savimbi, outraged at the indiscriminate killing, restarted the offensive and the civil war continued, becoming even more destructive than the first half. The MPLA have been accused of systematic extermination of the Bakongo and Ovimbundu people who supported UNITA. UNITA also committed horrific atrocities, financing their effort through the sale of blood diamonds and the use of child soldiers. In 2002, Jonas Savimbi was killed in battle, and UNITA was forced into a ceasefire. The civil war was over. The following years saw the creation of one of Africa's most corrupt states under the MPLA and President Dos Santos. Angola's huge oil wealth was used to consolidate MPLA control through state-owned enterprises, almost all of whose profits ended up in the pockets of government officials. Public services are some of the poorest in the world, social expenditure remains low, and infant mortality is high. Meanwhile, MPLA officials remain multi-millionaires. Dos Santos remained president until 2017, and passed away recently in July 2022. His corrupt autocratic state persists, and succeeds in its goal of benefiting the elite, while keeping the public powerless. There is perhaps no more famous example of a tyrannical African state than Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe serves as a prime example of the damning effect apartheid has on a nation and its people, an effect which can still be felt to this day. What we would call Zimbabwe began its life as the self-governing colony of southern Rhodesia in the late 1800s, a union of the territories of Mashonaland and Matabeleland. Southern Rhodesia was ruled reluctantly by Britain, though fully administered as a private enterprise under Cecil Rhodes. During this time, Southern Rhodesia's vast diamond wealth was thoroughly exploited and an agricultural economy in which 307,000 white farmers owned all of the land was established. A system of apartheid not dissimilar from that in South Africa was established. The six million black people in the colony were segregated from society, not allowed to enjoy simple privileges like going to restaurants, swimming in white-only pools, or even drinking European beer. 
Thus, the colony remained divided between its white minority and black majority, wholly unprepared for any kind of independence. Yet, despite this, Britain attempted to do so in the years after World War II. The British administration hoped to grant Southern Rhodesia independence under black majority rule, as it had done in all of its other African colonies. But the ruling white minority was not prepared for this eventuality. They looked around them and became nervous. Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, gained independence in 1964 and began a campaign of Africanization. Nyasaland, now Malawi, similarly became ruled by its black population. But what scared them most was what happened in the Belgian Congo, which descended into chaos and resulted in massacres against the white population. During this period of global decolonization, black resistance took shape across Africa. In 1958, a conference was held in Accra, capital of the newly independent Ghana, the first African country to achieve this. Ghana's president, Kwame Nkrumah, spoke about revolution, about freeing Africa from colonialism and white rule. The passion with which the president spoke was enough to inspire a young intellectual in attendance to seek black rule in his homeland of southern Rhodesia. His name was Robert Mugabe. Soon after, Mugabe would become leader of the Zimbabwe African National Union, ZANU, after being suspended from its rival organization, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, ZAPU. The white government, under Prime Minister Ian Smith, then unilaterally declared independence from Britain in 1965, hoping to keep the power they held. After this, there was no stopping Smith's government from violently cracking down on Mugabe's black resistance. The Rhodesian Bush War began, one of Africa's most infamous conflicts, and would continue for 15 years. During this conflict, major atrocities were committed by both sides. Because of the unconventional nature of its fighting, both sides adopted unconventional strategies. The white government, who unofficially saw black majority rule as inevitable, adopted a strategy that would guarantee them the best possible negotiating position whenever the war would end. This consisted of carrying out brutal attacks against ZANU and ZAPU forces to attempt to weaken them as much as possible. The black nationalist strategy was far more brutal. Mugabe's forces relied on creating terror and fear in the white, but particularly the black population. Violence and coercion were used to win over the rural black population, who didn't much care for the political goals of ZANU. Collaborators thus used ZANU militants to settle personal scores in their communities. The war continued until 1979, when the Smith government was forced to the negotiating table after international sanctions and strengthening black militias with Soviet, Chinese, Zambian and Mozambican support had weakened them beyond repair. A ceasefire under the Lancaster House Agreement was established, guaranteeing free elections as a new independent republic. However, Mugabe only agreed reluctantly. This evening, Lord Carrington pretended that all had been well, pretended that there had been progress. As far as the Patriotic Front is concerned, there have not been discussions at all with anybody in respect of the substantive matters regarding the ceasefire. And we insist that there can never be any agreement. This is just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Nobody will take cognizance of it. In his eyes, anything less than military victory over the white forces was too great a compromise. Because of this, violence never truly ended. The elections of 1980 produced a violent struggle. Rhodesian forces tried to kill Mugabe several times and routinely murdered black canvassers. On the other side, ZANU, now ZANU-PF, continued to engage in terror tactics throughout the countryside. Villagers were brutalized, tortured and killed, primarily those who supported ZANU's rival ZAPU. The interim government was left with a difficult decision. Either they would disqualify Mugabe from running, which, due to his being the most popular candidate, would have caused the civil war to resume, or they would allow him to anyway, despite his violent tendencies. In the end, they went with the latter, and Mugabe's ZANU-PF ended up winning 63% of the vote, giving them an outright majority in parliament. 
Like many other African nations, this victory followed racial lines. Mugabe belonged to the majority Shona population, who voted overwhelmingly for his party, while Zapu drew support from the minority in the Bele population. In his victory speech, Mugabe promised reconciliation. The wrongs of the past must now stand forgiven and forgotten. If ever we look to the past, let us do so for the lesson the past has taught us. Namely, that oppression and racism are inequalities that must never find scope in our political and social system. It could never be a correct justification that just because the whites oppressed us yesterday, when they had the power, the blacks must oppress them today, because they have the power. An evil remains an evil, whether practiced by white against black, or black against white. This was a blatant lie. It didn't take long for Mugabe to begin cracking down on dissent in his new independent Zimbabwe. After the war, many ZANU and ZAPU fighters deserted and began terrorizing the countryside with aid from apartheid South Africa. Mugabe then used this situation to strengthen his own grip on power. The military, under the infamous 5th Brigade, an elite force trained by North Korean officers, entered Matabele Land in 1983 and began a campaign of terror. Soldiers conducted village-to-village -village raids, systematically torturing and killing ethnic and Debele civilians, leaving behind violent displays as warnings. When confronted with what was happening to innocent civilians, Mugabe stated that he was aware, defending it by saying, we can't tell who is a dissident and who is not. This genocide, which became known as Gukura Hundi, resulted in up to 30,000 deaths. But internationally, there was silence. Mugabe was an ally of the Eastern Bloc, and so the Soviets and Chinese refused to upset him. In the West, the Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher administrations stayed quiet, afraid of triggering the same against the white population. In fact, Mugabe even visited the White House in September 1983, despite the world knowing what was going on. The genocide in Matabele land resulted in the effective destruction of any black opposition, and turned Zimbabwe into a one-party state. But the white community still remained almost untouched. Under Mugabe, Zimbabwe's economy was falling apart. Corruption became endemic and institutionalized. Mismanagement and overcrowding led to the enrichment of the elite at the expense of the wider black population. And so Mugabe put the blame on the West and the white minority, espousing a dangerous rhetoric. In 2000, it came to a head. Mugabe began bribing police, military and unemployed youths to attack white-owned farms and seize their property without compensation. This campaign of violence continued for eight years and resulted in virtually all white-owned farms being redistributed, often through means of torture and murder. This campaign, though successful in winning over populist support, destroyed Zimbabwe. Farms were handed over to those with no experience, causing nationwide shortages and inflation to skyrocket to a never-before-seen 89.7 sextillion percent. That's 897, followed by eight zeros. But nothing could be done. Zimbabwe became a one-party state consolidated around Mugabe's ZANU-PF. As the years progressed, Mugabe was overcome with megalomania and became convinced that he was immortal. Because of this, he refused to appoint a successor until November 2017, his wife Grace Mugabe. Soon after, his close general, Emerson Mnangagwa, turned on him, disgusted at the appointment, and ousted Mugabe in a coup. Mugabe died under house arrest two years later, and Mnangagwa has been president ever since. Zimbabwe is still reeling from Mugabe's reign of terror and economic mismanagement. His institutions of corruption continue to hold the country back, and power remains centralized around ZANU-PF. Zimbabwe remains a cautionary tale of the dangers of populism. Uganda's story of the 20th century is one of Africa's most famous. Uganda, like Zimbabwe and Angola before, never existed as a political entity until British colonization in 1894. However, Uganda enjoyed a greater degree of autonomy than most other colonies, being administered primarily by the native black population. Because of this, Uganda was a relatively peaceful territory that was only mildly opposed to British rule, even when independence became inevitable. Due to this, the transition was relatively smooth and unencumbered by violence. 
However, an unresolved issue remained a burden for independent Uganda. The south of the country was ruled by the Kingdom of Buganda, a distinct political entity which had been lumped into Uganda by the British. Thus, Uganda's immediate post-independence period was marred by conflict between the government, under President Milton Obote, and the Kingdom of Buganda. This conflict, known as the Buganda Crisis, set the stage for Uganda's politics to become divided along ethnic lines. The government drew support from the various Nilotic tribes in the north, whilst the opposition and the Buganda Kingdom drew from the Bantu tribes in the south. The conflict also allowed for the rise of an ambitious field marshal by the name of Idi Amin Dada, who led military incursions to crush the Kingdom of Buganda, resulting in 2,000 deaths. Idi Amin was born and raised in the rural north, dropping out of school after fourth grade before joining the British King's African Rifles. He was skilled, and quickly rose to the ranks to become one of only two Ugandans to be commissioned officers. But he possessed a violent streak. As commander of the 4th KAR, Amin led a check in Kenya to investigate claims of cattle rustling. What was supposed to be a simple check turned into the Turkana massacre, where Kenyan civilians were tortured, killed, and buried alive. Rather than prosecute Amin, Obote and the British chose instead to ignore it. After all, it would have looked bad if one of the two Ugandan commissioned officers was court-martialed. The authorities in action against Amin, as well as the corrupt and brutal government under Obote, facilitated his rise. In the 60s, Amin led a covert campaign of violence targeting government officials, including an assassination attempt on Obote himself. When Obote ordered an investigation into the attempt, Amin had the lead investigator, Brigadier Okoya, murdered alongside his wife. What began was a race to see who could defeat the other, Obote or Amin. On the 25th of January 1971, that question was answered. With British and Israeli support, Amin led a coup d'etat while Obote was in Singapore, establishing what he called a temporary military administration. The truth was that Amin never intended to let go. His reign was famous for its brutality and scale. An immediate purge of Obote supporters and perceived threats began. Benedicto Kiwanuka, Uganda's first Prime Minister and Amin's Chief Justice, was arrested for criticising Amin's disregard for rule of law. Accounts say he was then mutilated, disemboweled and castrated, before being burned alive. Janani Luwum, Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, was arrested for preaching human rights. Officially, he was killed in a car crash whilst being transported to prison. Yet the body, returned to his family, had four bullet wounds. By the end of Amin's first year in power, about two-thirds of the army had been executed, and untold numbers of opponents and perceived opponents were tortured, disappeared, and executed. In Amin's first years in power, he had been propped up with British and Israeli support, who attempted to use him as a way to influence local power balances. But even for them, his lack of reason became too much, and support was cut off after Amin refused to pay for the military hardware they had given him. And so Amin took a full 180, going from the West's pet in East Africa to the East's. Uganda's ties with the Eastern Bloc were deepened, and Amin became a key ally of the Soviet Union and Gaddafi's Libya. Within a few months, Amin went from one of Israel's closest allies to denouncing Zionism and severing all diplomatic ties. The deterioration of relations with Israel came to a crescendo in 1976 when far-left Palestinian and German terrorists hijacked Air France Flight 139 and were permitted to land at Entebbe Airport, holding 94 Israeli passengers and crew hostage with Ugandan support. The ordeal ended when elite Israeli commandos managed to free the hostages with Kenyan support, and the fallout within Uganda and around the world was immense. During the ordeal, a 75-year-old passenger, Dora Bloch, became ill and was taken to hospital in Kampala. She was there during the raid and was never rescued. When news reached Amin that the hostages had been freed, he ordered his soldiers to remove Dora Bloch from her hospital bed and had her executed. Hundreds of Kenyans in Uganda were also executed as punishment for Kenya's role in the operation. Over the course of his rule, Amin deteriorated mentally at a fast pace, 
Historians have hypothesized that Amin was suffering from untreated syphilis. His erratic, illogical, and harsh behavior, which progressively became worse, has been said to resemble that of someone suffering from the disease. And because the Ugandan state revolved entirely around him, the rest of the country suffered as well. By 1978, most of Amin's inner circle had defected or fled. His arbitrary and unjustified killings had caused loyalty to drop. In November 1978, the beginning of the end happened. Ugandan soldiers mutinied across the Tanzanian border, prompting Amin to launch an invasion to bring them to justice. But Tanzania was able to push back the disorganized and brutalized Ugandan military. Seeing the writing on the wall, Amin sent a request to Tanzanian President Nyerere, challenging him to settle the war with a boxing match. The request, surprisingly, went unanswered, and Kampala was captured in 1979. Amin then fled into exile in Saudi Arabia, leaving Uganda in a state of chaos under his old enemy, President Obote. The civil war which followed lasted until 1986, when the rebel leader Yauri Museveni captured Kampala and became president, being officially elected in 1996. Under Museveni, a new tyranny came to be. Though not nearly as erratic or brutal as Amin, power remained under his complete control. The constitution was altered to remove term limits, elections were rigged with ballot stuffing, intimidation and violence. Museveni has built Uganda into a fundamentalist Christian regime, one of the only in the world to harshen sentences for LGBT citizens, introducing life imprisonment for those who have gay sex and has suggested introducing the death penalty. LGBT citizens and activists are routinely used as scapegoats by Museveni to legitimize his regime, and Uganda remains the 11th worst country for LGBT rights in Africa, which, for Africa, is impressive to say the least. Do you personally dislike homosexuals? Of course, they are disgusting. What, what, what sort of people are they? How can you go... Uh, I don't. I never knew what they were doing. That's how I've been told recently that uh, what they do is terrible, disgusting. But I was I was ready to ignore that if there was proof that that's how he's born. In 2021, Museveni yet again rigged the election, shutting down the internet, persecuting opponents, and using the police force to beat and intern protesters. He won 58.6 percent of the vote. Uganda remains shackled by its new dictator, though there is some hope, as the opposition continues to fight for freedom. From 1884 to 1885, as European powers began the scramble for Africa, an outlier remained in the east of the continent. Alongside Liberia, Ethiopia remained one of only two African nations to survive and remain independent. Ethiopia, previously referred to as Abyssinia, is ancient, the hypothesized birthplace of human beings as a species. Ethiopia began as a relatively small kingdom, occupying what is now modern-day Amhara and Tigray. Over the course of the 19th century, faced with threats from outsiders, the kingdom expanded to encompass diverse groups of ethnicities, cultures, languages, and religion. It is this diversity that has always been the main cause of Ethiopia's woes. Because of it, Ethiopian institutions have been built to ensure stability and unity first and foremost, and power was centralized heavily with the emperor. Loyalty to the emperor was rewarded well, and disloyalty was punished severely, leading to atrocities against many of Ethiopia's ethnic minorities, who sought greater freedom from the crown. Ethiopia's descent would begin with the crowning of its most famous emperor, Haile Selassie, in 1930. Emperor Selassie is a globally revered figure even still today, being a champion of reform. Under his reign, the Ethiopian constitution was introduced to replace the Coptic Christian theocratic order establishing Ethiopia's first parliament and judiciary, and finally abolishing slavery. In 1935, Mussolini's fascist Italy invaded and occupied the country until its liberation in 1941. Following this, Selassie became a champion of economic and political modernization, but at a cost. Like his predecessors, Selassie punished disloyalty harshly. In 1948, Harari and Somali Muslims staged a rebellion, 
Under Emperor Menelik II, these people had been promised autonomy, something which had never been delivered. In response to the rebellion, Selassie crushed it violently, placing the entire town of Harar under arrest and expropriating almost all of the population's property. The violent method of dealing with unrest would become the common response of the imperial government, something which, in 1952, would herald the beginning of the end. In 1952, the territory of Eritrea was ceded to Ethiopia from Britain as part of a federation. Ten years later, following armed resistance, Eritrea was fully annexed into the Ethiopian Empire. The annexation of Eritrea would spark a domino effect the imperial government would never recover from. Military resources poured into Eritrea, turning the region into a constant battlefield where brutality and atrocity were commonplace. The war in Eritrea served to distract Selassie's government from the rest of the country, where famine permeated. In Tigray, a famine left almost 100,000 dead. In Amhara too, but the biggest would come in Wolo in 1973, where over 200,000 perished. The government was revealed to have been aware of what was happening in Wolo, but chose not to act out of apathy. This was the final straw for Selassie's regime. Riots spread throughout the country, coinciding with a military mutiny in 1974. This mutiny would soon become too quick for the imperial government to act, and, soon after it began, Selassie was imprisoned by a military junta infamously known as the Derg a collection of self-avowed Marxists claiming to be warriors against imperialism. A year after his capture, Selassie died, officially from respiratory failure, but a later committee found in 1994 that the Derg administration had him strangled in his sleep. After the takeover, 60 former imperial officials and members of the royal family were arrested and executed without trial. The imperial tyranny that had existed for over a century was swiftly replaced by a new, more brutal Marxist one, headed by its chairman, Mengistu Haile Mariam, a bloodthirsty, power-hungry man. The new communist regime quickly aligned itself with the Eastern Bloc, purchasing arms and receiving aid from the Soviet Union, arms which would be used in Mengistu's Red Terror. Weapons were distributed across the country to civilian militias, with orders to kill those opposed to the revolution resulting in house-to-house -house searches for suspected opponents who were summarily executed. But these militias often didn't care about ideology and used the chaos to settle personal scores. The scale and speed of the arms distribution was so massive that Mengistu's government even, unknowingly, distributed arms to many militias who were loyal to rebel groups. The Red Terror resulted in the deaths of around 500,000 people, most of them innocent with nothing to do with politics. Sometimes bodies were even displayed in public, with signs around their necks reading, Mistaken Identity. The scale and arbitrary nature of Mengistu's regime created a country gripped by chaos, violence and famine, the most famous of which inspired Bob Geldof's Live Aid concert in 1982, raising £150,000 in famine relief. A lot of that money would end up funding Mengistu's Red Terror. But as history often goes, brutality doesn't create loyalty alone. The bloodshed in Ethiopia fueled resistance from rebel factions in Tigray, Amhara, Oromo, and Eritrea who, in 1991 after over a decade of civil war, managed to capture Addis Ababa. Mengistu was forced to flee to Zimbabwe, where he resides in peace to this day, free from the consequences of his genocidal regime. After the fall of the communist government, Eritrea gained its independence, and Ethiopia's government was ruled by successive members of the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, until, in 2018, they were voted out and replaced by the Coalition Prosperity Party under the leadership of Abiy Ahmed. Displeased with their loss of power, the TPLF rebelled in 2020, beginning the now ongoing Tigray War. It seems that Ethiopia has still failed to overcome its internal ethnic divisions and now faces the threat of balkanization. Like his predecessors, Abiy Ahmed's government has taken a firm stance of stability and unity overall, attempting to beat the rebels by any means necessary. Any means necessary. Ethiopia's future remains uncertain and dangerous. Will the federal government prevail and preserve Ethiopia's integrity? Or will the ethnic divisions become too great to resist?
These are the questions Ethiopia must answer soon. Somalia, the poster child for failed states. The roots of Somalia's turmoil, like most all African nations, is found through a mix of colonialism and ethnic tribal division. Somalia was colonized by two powers. Britain took the northern Somaliland province, while the rest of the country was taken by Italy. Somali culture is unique. Politics and life in Somalia is dominated by the clan system, a complex network dividing the population into families and subfamilies, each with their own subtly different cultures and traditions. Throughout most of its history, Somalia was a hotbed for conflict between competing clans. This division was exacerbated by colonization. Britain and Italy ruled their respective regions entirely differently. In British Somaliland, economic self-sufficiency and stability was paramount, leading to a more liberal culture. In contrast, Italian Somalia was administered through force in an attempt to assimilate Somalis into Italian culture. This force only grew worse under the fascist regime. During this period, a boy by the name of Mohamed Siad Bari was born in Ogaden, on the border between Ethiopia and Italian Somalia. Mohamed Siad Bari is perhaps the most important figure in Somali history, and his story is crucial to understanding Somalia as a whole. Bari was a military man and a skilled one at that, rising through the ranks of the Italian military rapidly, becoming a major general in the British colonial army after the Italian defeat in World War II. His military journey and determination was sparked by a traumatic moment in his childhood. At the age of 10, Bari's clan was at war with the Isaac clan of Somaliland. During this war, a young Bari was forced to watch the murder of both his father and his brother. This was Bari's defining moment that would shape the person he would become. According to his biographers, at the tender age of 10, young Muhammad first witnessed the murder of his own father. The shock and impact of this life experience and the difficult circumstances of life as an orphan put a very deep scar in his psyche. It is from this difficult childhood that Bari developed a complex sense of cunning, sadism, insecurity and vengeance. In 1960, Somalia gained its independence, merging both the British and Italian territories into a new republic. The Somali Republic legitimized itself with a policy of irredentism, that is, the belief that all ethnic Somalis should be part of one nation through conquest and expansion if necessary. Thus, Somalia laid claims to territories such as northeastern Kenya, the entirety of Djibouti, and, most importantly, the Ogaden Plateau in eastern Ethiopia. This policy soured any kind of diplomatic relations Somalia could have had with any of its neighbours, and a low-intensity armed conflict with Ethiopia persisted throughout the 1960s. But failing to achieve any military victory, the government abandoned this policy, much to the dismay of the Somali people. And so, in 1969, Siad Bari launched his bloodless coup d'etat under the banner of anti-imperialist socialism declaring the new Somali Democratic Republic and re-adopting the Irredentist policies. To the Bari regime, this policy was nothing more than a means of domestic control to keep the population turned towards common external enemies. In the early years of his rule, Bari attempted to weaken the clan system in pursuit of a common Somali identity instead, but possibly because of his traumatic childhood, Bari retained an intense hatred of the Isaac clan in the north. On the world stage, Bari was a close friend of the Soviet Union, who gave hundreds of millions of dollars in financial and military support, leading to Somalia possessing the largest and most powerful army in all of Black Africa. Bari, as mentioned before, was socialist, but this was nothing more than a facade. His true goal was the dominance of his clan over all others. All higher-ups in the regime were members of Bari's clan, and others were routinely discriminated against. His belief of clan supremacy was ramped up to 11 when, in 1977, he invaded Ethiopia in an attempt to conquer the Ogaden territory, being decisively defeated only eight months later. It was this defeat that began Bari's descent into madness. Socialism was abandoned, all ties with the Soviet Union were severed and Somalia aligned itself instead with the US. 
Clanism became the government's new ideology. Division between clans across the country were exploited by the government to trigger conflict in an effort to weaken any kind of opposition to the Bari regime. As well as this, the war with Ethiopia had caused an influx of over one million refugees, making one in four Somalis refugees. Bari used this fact to trick foreign powers into granting aid. This aid was then given to loyal members of Bari's Darod clan and withheld from the Isaks, who had suffered most as a result of the war. Foreign aid was also used to purchase arms, arms which were distributed amongst the newly arrived refugees. What Bari had intended all along was revenge. Revenge against the Isak clan for what had happened to him in his childhood. He had created an army loyal to him in the Isak heartland and began a campaign of terror. The violence became so intolerable that, in 1981, the Isak clan rebelled and declared the independence of Somaliland, but the violence would only get worse. General Mohammed Saeed Hersi Morgan, Barry's son-in-law, wrote a letter of policy recommendation regarding the rebellion. In it, he proposed a final solution and coldly outlined a list of methods to exterminate the virus of the state. In 1988, the plan was put into action at a scale never before seen in African history. Isak civilians were explicitly targeted in aerial and artillery bombardments, who were told to prioritize the destruction of homes and water sources. Civilians who attempted to flee to Ethiopia were then strafed by the Somali Air Force. Meanwhile, on the ground, the armed Ogadeni refugees assisted the government with looting, mass rape, and summary executions. By the end of the war, the cities of Hargeisa and Burao, the second and third largest cities in Somalia respectively, had almost completely been destroyed with their populations massacred. The two-year nightmare came to be known as the Hargeisa Holocaust and resulted in the deaths of between 50 and 200,000 Isak civilians. The scale of violence was unprecedented, and so too was the response. Bari's sadism and megalomania caused the creation of dissident groups who received arms from Ethiopia. By 1990, two years after the Hargeisa Holocaust, almost the entire country entered open rebellion under dozens of separate militias and it didn't take long for them to win. On January 26, 1991, Mogadishu was captured, and Siad Bari fled to Nigeria, where he lived in exile until his death in 1995. The totalitarian state that he had built left Somalia in a deep power vacuum impossible to fill. And so the dozens of rebel groups turned on one another, seeking to fill it. The culture of violence and clan conflict that Bari had cultivated still holds to this day and now, Somalia pretty much doesn't exist as a state anymore. However, in the north, Somaliland finally achieved its goal of independence. Today, Somaliland remains a stable and safe democracy, although incredibly flawed and corrupt. Although unrecognized by any other country and still recovering from the violence of the 80s, Somaliland continues to move forward into the modern age. The rest of Somalia, however, remains gripped by the civil war that began over 30 years ago and has so far resulted in up to 500,000 deaths and 1 million displaced. The conflict shows no signs of ending as foreign powers use the chaos to advance their own goals. The stories of these nations show a dark pattern in African history. A country is freed from colonialism. A power-hungry person or organization takes advantage with promises of prosperity and freedom, and the country descends into tyranny or chaos. The African tyrants who adopted revolutionary, leftist ideals often ended up the most despotic of all. Human life and its preservation were often viewed as obstacles to absolute power. But also, these dictators were used simply as pawns in the great power game, who didn't care for the suffering of those on the ground. It begs the question, what would have happened if the MPLA hadn't been supported by the USSR or Cuba? What would have happened if Idi Amin's rise hadn't been supported by Britain and Israel? Or if Siad Bari's regime hadn't been allowed to continue with weaponry from the USSR? Would these countries be better off? Or would their so-called revolutionaries have come to power regardless? Who can say? Today, their legacy is still being felt as African nations reel from the erosion of institutions 
and the establishment of endemic corruption. It'll take years to recover from, but places like Somaliland give us hope that from the chaos and brutality of dictatorial regimes can arise democracy and stability. It'll just take some time. This video was inspired by and partially adapted from Dictatorland, The Men Who Stole Africa by Paul Kenyon, which you can buy in the description below. Some other books that inspired and helped with research were The New Map by Daniel Jurgen, which explores African geopolitics today, and The Power of Geography by Tim Marshall, which has an excellent dive into Ethiopian politics and really helped with that section. All are available to buy in the description. This video took a lot of work, uh, the most of any I've ever done, and it wouldn't have been possible without the support on Patreon. Special shout out to Joshua Roll, my huge guy. If you'd like to support what I do, consider donating on Patreon. Uh, any amount helps. Thank you all for watching this long, long video, and I'll hopefully uh, be seeing you all in a slightly shorter one very soon.